Every story has to have a beginning. We in this room, I, all have a beginning. Today, we start at the beginning of the story of the story. We have these available on our campuses. You can find them just about anywhere uh, out there. And it goes through, again, this wonderful story of where we come from, what has happened before us, what's happening right now, and what is to come for us. It's right here in God's Word. And in this case, it's written in a way that helps kind of bring us into God's Word in maybe a little bit easier way as a narrative, all put in the right order. And as you look at the sermon today, I put in page numbers and, and where you can follow along and, and where you can read further, and it's just a wonderful, exciting sermon for me to deliver because I get to talk about our origins, where we come from. How exciting is that? It is the beginning of you. It is the beginning of me. It is the beginning of all humankind, finding out who our Creator is. And over the next several months, I think almost a year, we're going to be going through this rich and wonderful story, starting with the creation side and then moving on through all of those wonderful relationships that God had as He continues to work with us to this very day. And it's pretty exciting stuff. And we're going to start with the first really small chunk, which is creation through Babel. Uh, yeah, that's a chunk. But I'm going to draw something out that's very important for us. Because if we don't know it, don't send your kids out of your house. Don't send them to school. Don't go out into the public. If you don't understand this very basic piece of theology, this very basic piece of who we are and what we believe in, because it sets up everything to follow. We're going to look at that today. But creation starts simply enough with nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God would go on to make all the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures. To really understand who we are, to understand how our story begins, to understand our place in all of this around us, past, present, future, we need to understand, first of all, that we were created by God. And you're going to hear all sorts about where our creation came from, where we came from as humanity, where we came from as a people, because we have an insatiable desire to find our Creator. We have a desire to find out where we've come from. Do you know how many companies there are out there making, I think, a very good profit about ancestry? going back and finding out whether we have sort of a musician or, or, or maybe a king in our background or, or how our families were formed and, and kind of what makes us who we are. We're very curious now about our DNA because it helps maybe know which region of the world we come from or, or what we can look for. We are very curious about how we are built and where we come from. And that's no accident because we have a creator and it is our desire in many of our human sort of interactions that want us to kind of find out, well, how did all this start? What's the beginning to all of this? And so listen to me now again. You were created by God to be with Him. That's how it all started. We were created to be with Him. Now, in, on the inside cover of the, uh, the, the story, you're going to see this little map here, which I put up. And when we're talking about the original creation story, uh, where the first humans are coming out of, it's coming out of Eden. And we believe it's either at the beginning of the Tigris and the Euphrates River or at the bottom. Uh, it could be either or. And so this is the area, though, that even modern science today has said is sort of the, the birthplace or the, the ground in which all sort of uh, human activity has come out of. This is sort of that wellspring. And so it all leads, according to the Bible as well, to this area. And I, I want to put up another map just so you can see a little bit of where the water is. So when you look at those same spots, you can see there's quite a bit of water and tributaries, and there's just a richness in this plain where humanity could spring from. And so this is where God has placed us 
in the very beginning. Okay, there's some of the little basics about where it started and a little bit about the geography. But what I really want to focus on is right here today. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him or us. Male and female, he created them. God created us, and that in the image of God, and that's very important to us. We have to grasp what this means because it kind of boils down to a lot of what we have faith in. We are going to get into a little bit of metaphysics, <laughs> existence, and etymology, the study of truth. Now, don't turn the lights out on me, please. Uh, these are big words. I need you to focus, pay attention, because this is important for us to get a grasp on. When we talk about the existence of God and what that means for us, and when we interact with the world around us, we need to understand this. And the image of God really matters. In order for us to have a relationship with God, we need to have connection points. We need to have that ability. So I have a couple of friends over here next to me. First is my pet rock. I tried to stick googly eyes on this rock and they never would stick. Glue must have been made with something different when I was growing up, maybe lead or asbestos, but uh, it just doesn't work. So I just had to draw it on the rock. So uh, this is my pet rock. And I can have a relationship with a rock, I guess, or no, I mean, maybe if I found it in the ocean when I was at some beautiful island, I might have a connection with it, but can I really have a good relationship with a rock? Uh, probably not, right? It has a smiley face, so he's happy with me. That's nice. Okay, what I, I real, I'm upping the game now. Can I have a relationship with my Sheltie? Uh, this is a, an exact replica of the dog I have at home. His name is Bear, and uh, he's an awesome dog, and, and whether you knew it or not, Dogs are the only creatures in existence that want to be with man and please them, okay? All the other animals could care less about humanity, and cats included. They would live on their own the next day. They don't care. Horses, they don't care. The only animals that actually want to please us are dogs, and, and, and they're really cool, and this, my dog loves me, I think, and we get along, and I love my dog, but can I, what kind of a relationship can I have with a dog? A, a, a deep one, sure, but... It's kind of surface level, I guess. So if I want to have a strong relationship, I need to have more than just that. And God building us, creating you to be with Him, gave you pieces of Himself so that you could know God, so that you could know God deeply. How amazing is that, that you are that precious to our Lord? We needed that, right? Well, then I met my wife. I've had a dog, I've had a pet rock, but then I met my wife. And when you're around someone that closely for so long, and you have friends, you don't have to have a wife to have this type of relationship, when you're around another human being for a while, like my wife, um, always next to each other, getting to know each other, where all it takes is an imperceptible adjustment of the cuff to know that I'm feeling bad or I need something. You begin to understand what depth of relationship is, what that means to connect, what that means to talk, what that means to have common points that you can deeply get to know someone else and have that strong relationship with. And if God wants that for us, He needed to give us something special. This is where I very rarely bring in theologians, but this is where we bring in Thomas Aquinas to help us out a bit called analogy of being. This is a huge understanding that we need to have as Christians to know how God wants for us and how He built us, right? Um, which means we are similar to God. We have different qualities of God, though not at the same level. They're a pale shadow, but we have these qualities that separate humanity from everything else in creation for the one reason of relationship. So let me give you an example, or several. First, intelligence. God is intelligent. We are intelligent. God is self-aware. We are self-aware. God has the ability to choose, and so do we. A matter of fact, being self-aware, we can go, you know what, I really want that donut, but I need to lay off. We, we, we have this ability to be self-aware and make different decisions, unlike any other creature in existence. We have complex language. God, of course, has language. God is creative. As a matter of fact, I think God is at His best when He's creating. He does it all the time. 
We can be creative. We have that capacity. We have the capacity to see beauty and appreciate the beauty of the world around us and the things that show up to us. So does God as he paints in beauty. We have the capacity for hope and perseverance and joy. We can love, give, experience, love. God can do all of these and more. And he put that inside of you for the singular reason that we would know him, that we could talk with him, that we could experience God in our life and have that relationship. Isn't that incredibly important to know? This is what you were built for. Now, this is a far cry from those who would say that God created the universe and then walked away. Sitting behind some big desk playing solitaire, I don't know what he does right? If that's the God that that you think is out there. No, no, this is a God who who built you to spend time with Him, to spend time with each other. And the further you are away from that mark, the more we suffer, the more we go awry, the more our life spirals, because we were built to be with Him. We were built to have this relationship. From the very beginning, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Spirit over the waters, Let us make him in the image, us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool? God did this to be in a perfect relationship with him. If you want to understand your story, if you want to understand your place, then this is it. Because I'm telling you right now, any horizontal relationship you have in your life, friends, family, is affected by your vertical relationship with God, without a doubt. And I've talked about this before because it's a great example. I try and avoid telling people I'm a pastor at first because they find out I'm a pastor, they treat me like their relationship with God is. If they're standoffish with God and they don't have a good relationship, as soon as they find out I'm a pastor, they kind of quickly move away from me until they get to know me better. I'm just people's. But I represent God to them, and so whatever their relationship is, how they treat me. And then eventually people end up confessing everything to me and all sorts after they get to know me, and and I get to see this relationship. The relationship you have with God affects every other relationship you have in your life because that's what you were built to have. So God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God is speaking to Adam and Eve. He's speaking. He's not far away. He's speaking. He's engaging. Wouldn't that be great today? There are times I would like, you know, just, just come on down and tell me what to do. Like, just put an image there and show me. And uh, God has done that many times in history. It hasn't worked so well. I, it, it's just, I, I, you know, look at that image. This is a loving God who wants interaction with us. God did not just create us. He's interacting with us because he wants a relationship. And if you want a relationship, you have to engage. You have to spend time. You have to talk. And that's what he built us to do. Look at the rest. Now, Lord God took man and put him in the... Oh, by the way, I have people ask me, a lot of times in men's studies, was work before or after the fall that we had to go to work? Was that before or after the fall? Here's your answer. It was before. God would never let you exist without a purpose. He would never let you exist without a purpose. Everyone in this room, if you're heading off to college, if you're going through school, if you're just starting out, listen to me right now. You have a purpose. And God is building you in every avenue of your life to live that out. When I first came here, I have a ton of business experience. I have multi-site experience. I have a lot of accounting and finance and human resource loaded in me. And I thought I'd have to throw all that garbage away so I could be a pastor. I am exhausted using all of that and more. Okay? God takes every moment of your life to build you into fulfilling a purpose. And yes, Adam was put to work right away. Mm -mm, No Saturday, Sunday for you. You're on it to take care of this beautiful place that God had given them. They were working together. How cool is that? Put them right to work. He had a purpose. And nothing can prove God's intention to have a relationship with you than the words, walk among us. To actually walk among us. Jesus walked among us. And so did God. I had to strip this verse down a little. We'll come back to the original later. 
Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't that be awesome? It's a beautiful day today, isn't it? What if you went home, you know, turned on the football? As I, you know, despite what happened last night, I still have the Chiefs. So maybe the Chiefs will win today. So I'm going to be going home, maybe eat, have a quick nap, and then walk with God in my garden today and tell him about my day. And we interact with one another and we talk and spend time. That's what we had. Adam and Eve. Isn't that amazing? The very presence of God. This is an intimate, this is a close God. This is one that built you to have relationship with Him. Never forget that. Never forget that. That gives you incredible meaning and purpose. You were meant to live in a perfect place in a perfect relationship with God. And He was delivering. <laughs> oh, yes. I can stop here if you want. <laughs> It doesn't answer the full question of why your life is the way it is now, but I suppose we should continue. This incredible lovingness for us that Carrie put into us makes what's about to happen one of the greatest betrayals of all time. Because in order to understand our story, in order to understand where you fit, in order to understand why your life is the way it is, we need to understand that even with all of this, we chose to turn away from Him. We chose to turn away from Him. We'll deal through this quickly. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. God said that. Did everyone hear it? God said this. <laughs> Here it goes. He said it. Later. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? Now, if you want to know why the serpent was there and why in the world the tree was there, I wish I could get into everything today. I cannot. But we invite you on Wednesday to come back on 6 o'clock hour and spend some time with Pastor Jonathan. There's a sheet on your way out, and it's available on our website to talk about the first chapter and prepare you for chapter two as you go and, and lots of great resources for you. But anyway, the serpent is here and he said the most haunting phrase that still dogs humankind to this day and will. Did God really say? Did God really say he loved you? I mean, did he look you in the eye and say he loved you? Did God really say Jesus died for you? Did God really say you have a future? Did God really say he'd take care of you? Did God really say the church should do this or that? Did God really say? I know this conversation happened because I am fighting this phrase to this very day. Did God really say that? Doubt. You must not eat from any tree in the garden. We just heard it. He said it. And, and, and Eve responded, uh, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Eh, it was close. But she gets the gist, don't mess with the tree, right? God did say that. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and the second phrase that is dogged humankind, you will be like God. That was the temptation. You will be like God. To want to control our world, to want to bind God and free ourselves, to want to be the next king of something of something, to rule, to have the power, to control. Humanity has wanted to be a God themselves almost from the beginning. That's hard. Did God really say, and you will be like God? We're still dealing with today, still dealing with it. And so, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree and was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who, by the way, was standing right next to her, you know, probably talking back and forth, navigating all of this. And, of course, he ate it as well. He's right there. This is what really hurts us, okay? This is what I want to make sure we have. So we have this, we were built in a perfect place in a perfect relationship. He built us for this. 
But now, what happened? We turned away from God. We wanted to be gods ourselves. We ate of the fruit, and that has brought us to our very day, the modern day. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What did they do? They hid from him. Does that sound like a good relationship to hide from someone? We chose to turn away. If you're trying to have a good relationship, I think they call it ghosting nowadays and things, when you just stop all communication and you disappear. Does that sound like a, a great thing for a relationship? No. And, and look, have we been trying to hide who we are from the people around us, from our community, from God? You can see little parts of me. I'm going to make a created image of me. You're going to think of me that way. From that very beginning, we have separated that full relationship before God, and now we are struggling as people. See this book? If this was the Bible, this is how many pages it talks about perfectness with God and relationship. You know what the rest of this is covered? You know what the rest of this stuff talks about? God trying to recover the relationship. The whole rest of it starts right there because we hide from God, we run from Him. The relationship is broken. After this, if you want to be a god, all right, good luck. You know what? First thing I'm going to do is give you some kids. Good luck with that. You'll know what it means to love someone who doesn't listen to you. Good luck. So he sent them out, and he goes, here you go. You want to be a god? You can start here. And you're going to need a lot of help from me, so I'm not going to abandon you, but good luck with that. He banished them from the Garden of Eden to work the ground for which they've been taken. I can't say, like, the impact of what happened to women over the years, but I can tell you what happened to me, because every time I go outside to do anything, creation fights me. Uh, masonry, painting, woodwork, working in the garden, creation fights me everywhere I go. Work wasn't the curse, uh, labor was the curse, right? The thistles and thorns and the fighting, that came after the fall. You want to be God? Good luck with that. And we've been struggling to get back to where ever since? Eden. We want that perfect house with the perfect acreage with the deer that goes, but doesn't eat my stuff. But just kind of goes through and, and are on the beach but no hurricanes. You know, we, we, we've been striving to get back to our origin ever since. We've been trying to find a perfect life and a perfect relationship. Where do you think that came from? It came from the beginning. We weren't built for this type of world. And so we struggle. But God did not leave us. You know what would come to pass after Adam and Eve did all this? Well, their kids didn't listen, and their kids listened less, and their kids listened even less. Can you imagine that over time, they didn't just ignore God, they forgot about Him altogether? Can you imagine a nation of people who would reject God and His ways and go their own way, doing whatever feels right and just forget Him? And that's what happened, though. And the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of his thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. They had forgotten God completely. But thank goodness at least Noah found favor in the Lord's eyes. The rest of the story, like I said, is all about... The rest of the story, right up to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, right up to our modern times today, it's all about recovering that relationship that was lost. It's all about God's work to reconnect us, to bring us back into relationship with Him. And it took Jesus' death on the cross to give us that chance to get back with Him intimately. Your Creator has given you the ability to have a relationship with Him. If you walk away with anything today, know that value and what you need to find. Whether you're in school, whether you're leaving, just find that relationship. Even though we have turned away in many ways and have destroyed God's original plan for us, man, we've been seeking the Garden of Eden ever since. Know that Jesus loves you dearly and has given everything to reconnect with you, everything. We have likeness, we have His Word, we have prayer, we have the witnesses around you. You know what? I am about as useless in the end compared to the Word of God and prayer than anything. Why do we even come to worship? What matters most and what we work on, what I work on, is to put the Word of God into your hands so that we may listen to Him. 
and then talk to him. That's it. If I can, if I can get everyone on the planet to just read a little bit, one minute a day, and then just talk with God, my job is done. You don't need me. That's how powerful that is, just a relationship, just to, just to hear His Word and to pray, just talk. That does everything. Everything else we do is just to get to that point. How powerful is that and how easy it is to know your Creator, know your Savior, truly have contentment even in the midst of chaos. I know those people in the midst of chaos. They have a good relationship with God to know truth and to be given real life. And if you struggle, start, pray. That's where we begin, and we thank God for it. Amen.